It's that time again. We've got some unplayable commander cards to go over. Cards that we always recommend cutting in order to improve your decks. I'm Mia, and I like taking extra napkins at restaurants. I'm BZ. I really like building cubes on Cube Cobra. We're the Nitpicking Nerds, sponsored by Card Kingdom. We're not sponsored by Cube Cobra. It sounded like I was going to say that, but it's actually Card Kingdom. That's the place we want you to go to buy and sell your magic cards. Once you go there, if you use our link in the description, they actually know that we sent you, and that helps our sponsorship continue into the future. We both want us both to succeed. If you want to buy a bunch of cards for your cube, perhaps, and you want them to all come in one package quickly to your door, I recommend you buy from Card Kingdom. Also, if you need to sleeve your cube, you should use Dragon Shield. Best sleeves the multiverse. Good sleeves. These segues are hot fire. If you use our code nerds at checkout you can save five percent of your real money tax dollars on your entire order total and let's not forget moxfield who will be appearing at a random point in this video and i will bamboozle you with it i guarantee so this is our segment i guess an ongoing series where we talk about cards that are unplayable so this is our opinion and we're only talking about unplayability in the sense that if you come to me with a deck and you ask us to improve your deck you know you're looking to make it more powerful there are certain cards that we would recommend cutting essentially 100% of the time. And this, these cards all fall under that category. In almost every scenario, we think your deck would be better if you cut these cards. This does not mean you are not allowed to play these cards. This does not mean we are objectively right. And uh, you got any other disclaimers you want to add? Uh, I'm not sure. It's just like, if you play these cards, we do not think less of you. Mm. We just think that if you have these cards in your deck, they can be replaced with better cards to help you further get to your win. The first card we're going to get into that you, we think your decks would be better without is Pillar of Origins. It's a two-mana rock. It taps for a mana of any color, but only to cast spells of the type you name when it enters. This is a 60-cent card. Uh, we are going to talk about why we think these cards don't necessarily belong in decks. And at the very end of the each card, we're going to give you some replacements at about the same budget level that we think you could probably play over this. Now, this card is weird to me because it kind of on its surface looks like a creature type, a kindred payoff, where it's like, oh, I'm playing dinosaurs. Well, this says I can choose dinosaurs and that it helps power out all my dinosaur spells. But the big thing with this card is what are we comparing this to? This is actually not a functional magic card unless you are doing something of this creature type. It's a weird one. I really don't like this because I, lo I love my kindred type decks. I have my elves, I have my vampires, you know? I've definitely dabbled in some other creature types prior, but in those, I'm not playing 100% that creature type. I have artifacts, you know? I have instants and sorceries that don't fall into that. In my 42 vampire deck, there are a bunch of cards that are obviously not vampires in there, so this is just sitting on the field useless if I'm playing any of those spells. That's like a pretty big portion of the time that I might want to cast one of those. So I would say that this is not good most of the time. Yeah, even in a scenario where you've got like 35 creatures of whatever type, dinosaurs, vampires, humans, even if you've got like 35 of them, that's still a little bit over half of your spells. And so if this said, add a mana of any color, but you can only use it on half your spells or 60% of your spells, that's not really something I'm interested in because then when we get to what we're comparing this to, uh, literally any other two mana rock, uh, if you're playing Naya, Naya dinosaurs, if you just have like Gruul Signet or Talisman of Conviction, those are going to tap for two out of three of your colors literally all of the time. And so it's weird to have a card that just does nothing when the baseline is I'm going to fix, you know, I'm going to add mana for any spell you cast. That's just what a Signet does. That's just what a Talisman does. So having one come along that's like, no, only 60% of your spells, I just get really turned off by that. We're not big fans of the unclaimed territories where you choose a creature type and you get a mana of that color, but only for that creature, or you can get a uh, colorless mana uh, to spend on whatever. So if we're not fans of that, why would we be fans of a mana rock that can only be used for that? Not even with like a colorless option to put into a spell. Y yeah, I don't like. We don't like those cards. You're right, but those cards are at least functional on their base, right? Like uh, unclaimed territory taps for a colorless. This just doesn't do that. It kind of maybe that's like hidden text that people assume is on the card, but there's no. Uh, functionality if this isn't doing a thing for your creature cards. So I'm super off on Pillow of Origins. It kind of just is a trap. I don't like the design of this card because most other kindred payoffs offer you a little something up front. And then if you're doing that creature type thing, you get to have an even better card. This is like, it goes from terrible and then your creature type uh, synergies bring you up to just a normal card. That's not what we want. I completely agree with that. I 
think that unless you have almost 100% of your spells or 100% of your spells being that creature type, which almost no one ever will, then this is pretty unplayable. The next card we want to get to is Vampire Nighthawk at 50 cents. One black black for a 2-3 with flying, death touch, and lifelink. I think this is kind of a relic of like older magic. This used to be better because we had a lot less like more powerful ETBs and stuff but in 2024 with power creep they are just printing so many better things in that three mana slot then this is not what I want to be playing. Yeah now I don't want anybody to judge other people for thinking that Vampire Nighthawk is good. Um, I know that a lot when we do YouTube shorts uh, they reach a wider audience than this audience right here and that is when if I start talking about the Vampire Nighthawk and I'm like hey guys I think you can take this card out of your deck they all look at me and they go are you out of your mind? This card is amazing. It attacks, it blocks, it gains me life. No one will attack into me. And I just think that goes to show like people have different views of the format. And you're coming here for our opinion. So we're going to give ours. I think Vampire Nighthawk is not enough these days, especially. The two power lifelink, I feel like we can almost just write that off because if we're beating in with it, then I don't think a two power flying lifelinker has all that fancy. And if we're blocking with it, then we're not going to gain more than two life ever because it'll trade off with whatever and maybe it'll deter something. But usually I don't think this is the case. I'm really not. I'm trying to think of scenarios where I'd want Vampire Nighthawk and it just to me, there's too many other high value plays that accrue card advantage over multiple turns or really deter things. You know, they say, whenever you attack me, I do this or I take out your creature or I get to draw a card from something. I'm not afraid of this card. If you are going to attack me, I'll happily take the two life. I mean, we start at 40 and there are a lot of chances with like extort, lifelink, etc. to go up in the format. So I'm never truly like, you know, going to be like, oh, 38, ouch, 36 from Vampire Nighthawk. Also, the fact is, if you're attacking, you don't have it as a blocker, so I can swing in with a bunch of things. You either have to keep it back on defense and hope someone attacks into you, but with Death Touch, they're less likely to, or you have to be on the offense, and then you don't have the Death Touch blocker. So you kind of have to pick and choose, and I'd say that either way, no matter which route you go, it's probably not the best like choice for either. Yeah, so this is a 50-cent card, and one of the things for me that just puts the absolute nail in the coffin is Nighthawk Scavenger is a card that exists. It's 60 cents. It's 10 more cents. And you get the exact same card, except it's a star three, a star plus one three. And the star is equal to the number of card types in your opponent's graveyard. So if there is a single card in any of your opponent's graveyards, this will be exactly Vampire Nighthawk. And then the more cards that happen, the more cards that go in, the more types. Usually there's three, four, five. Now we're getting up to like a six, three lifelink or a seven, three lifelink. And that those life swings, I think on offense, definitely matter. And on defense, you still have that like death touch thing. But for all those life gain decks and all those decks that want a little bit of a boost in life while maybe holding down the fort, I think this one for one swap is, is very, very easy for at least for me to make. I think it's very impactful to have that extra damage chipping in per turn if you are attacking with it. I would actually, sorry, go as far as to say there is no justification for Vampire Nighthawk being better than Nighthawk Scavenger. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Nighthawk Scavenger is just extra stats Vampire Nighthawk, same mana cost. I Same type, same creature type. Yeah, I don't see why you would actively choose to play Vampire Nighthawk over Nighthawk Scavenger if you have like unlimited budget or that sort of thing. Another option that you can use is Henrika Dumnathi. Two dollars a little bit more and it's two black black so a little bit more mana but you have more options. You can have people sacrifice creatures. You can transform her. I think you can draw a card and lose a life yep. and on the back she gets like flying, death touch, lifelink and mm -hmm. you can give extra stats to creatures with death touch or lifelink so I really do like having these options a little bit more even though it is only one more mana. Yeah, if you really, really are in the need for lifelink flyers, I don't think they're as valuable as some people seem to think. But if you really need this, here is that. You can play this on, on turn four, and if you really, really need a lifelink flyer for some reason, you can just transform it into a creature that's one, plus one, plus one better than Vampire Nighthawk. But if you don't need that, if you've got the developing the board and you've got some extra creatures to throw away, you can fire off an everybody sacks, which is pretty sick. Or you could just get your card back right away. And even on the backside, it now has another ability to plus. So this is another one that I think blows it out of the water just in terms of the options it gives you. Uh, what if I don't need a, a two power death touch lifelink blocker? I think that this coming out in what, like Crimson Val, right? Yep. 
<laughs> this is just like kind of proof how vampires have like evolved over the years because I remember Vampire Nighthawk being in the OG Edgar precon. It was like, a unit. And I was like, this is awesome. And now like just a few years later with one more mana, you have something that'll do everything, turns it over, does everything Vampire Nighthawk has, plus a <laughs> ability you could pay into. I think that just really sh goes to show like the power creep in Commander. Yeah, the other thing if you're just looking for like general life gain, accruing life over the course of the game. I still don't think Vampire Nighthawk is the way to go. If you want to trigger things that say, whenever you gain life, do this. I think Timurit Chosen from Death is a, is a good budget option. It's 35 cents, so it's cheaper than Nighthawk. It comes down cheaper. It actually does have a little bit of that blocking defense because it's going to have a high toughness equal to your devotion to black. So you can block with it on the ground. It doesn't have death touch, but you can pay one in a black to exile cards from graveyards and gain life if they're creatures. So we're now like actively disrupting people a little bit, messing with their graveyard, stopping them from doing certain sorceries and spells, and this is all in a, a two mana package that we can pump mana into later as we see fit, and it can gain life multiple times in a turn. I mean, maybe it's just because I play against BZ, or just because there are a lot more spells that are important from the graveyard, but I think it's so important to have a little bit of targeted graveyard hate nowadays, especially with like the collect evidence that just came out, the flashback spells, every single Carador deck that I seem to run into, all six. Who would build those? I don't know, but it is important to have that stapled onto some sort of like effect, and I think Timret's like pretty sturdy. Most people won't be using targeted removal on him, so he'll stick around for a little bit longer, you'll be able to get that life back, and you'll be able to take out some maybe key pieces from your opponent's graveyards. Yeah, I think if you're a diehard Nighthawk fan, uh, I try swapping it with any one of these, and I think it'll be like a life changer. It'll definitely, well, maybe it won't change your entire life, but it might give, make you go, oh, wow, this is pretty sick. Moving on to a card that I thought was absolutely unbeatable when I first started playing Magic. It's Platinum Angel at $4. 7 mana, 4-4 four, four Angel. You can't lose, your opponents can't win. I mean, that's literally unbeatable. It says it right there on the card. <laughs> that they can't win. I they mean, can't win. And you can't lose. So if this creature stays out, you basically just can't lose. But the, here's the thing, there's no protection on it, there's no hexproof, there's no indestructible, there's no, like, you know, you can't direct your spells from it alone, it's just it's just a 4-4, four four. it's a dude. It's know? a pretty big if, you know, you said if this stays in play, you can't lose. I think that A is a big if, and B, very ironically, Platinum Angel is one of those cards that, it looks super appealing, because obviously, you know, you like winning. The, text box, the text box of this card is off the wall, that's a really good text box. But the problem is that it's just stapled to a 7-mana card that has no other text. It doesn't do anything else for you. And so ironically, this kind of ends up leading you to lose more games when you put this in your deck because it's a 7-mana play that doesn't impact the board in any way. So you kind of have to ignore it in your opening hands. It's kind of a dud. It's it's a blank card. It's not going to help you develop. It's not going to help you answer any threats. If, if you're losing the game, it won't help you get out from under that. It will just say, hey, I'm going to stand in the way. Of, of this guy or girl losing the game, and you just gotta get through me. And with three other players, a lot of times that's not even that much of an inconvenience. So even if it is stopping you from losing and you're at negative 20, uh, it's a very killable card. It really is. I think I think just the fact that it dies to so much, whether that just be like a toxic deluge, you know, a ping from a death touch. A stray soul shatter. <laughs> yeah, just, at, you know, being forced to block from a 5-5 five, five being swung at it. You know, there's a lot of ways to remove it. It's not as sticky as like some of the other ones, like, you know, the big Avacins of the world or, you know, the ward hexproof, like indestructible type deals. It's you know? very squishy. You know, maybe that's a good way to look at it. It's very squishy and I, I, I think that this is almost the wrong mentality to have of playing cards that just say you can't lose. I think it's better to play cards that are pushing more towards I win and you lose versus like I can't lose. And I think that's why we don't see a lot of value and there's a lot of diminishing returns. I'm putting a bunch of fogs in your deck. It's like, yeah, sure, you can't lose, but how are you how are you closing the game? These cards aren't helping you be like offensive in any way. Yeah, like I don't like being dead in the water. I don't think anybody does. That's the appeal but, of this card. Yeah, but there's a point of like play more interaction at that point or try and get to your game plan faster rather than like stalling. I think this is a stalling card. I don't think this is a proactive card. Yeah, I do think a better move um, for Platinum Angel is if you have Platinum Angel in your deck, you could almost always just uh, cut it for Meteor Golem. It's a 35 cent 7 mana 3 3. ETB, it destroys a non land permanent. I'm not saying that Meteor Golem is like a perfect one-for-one -one replacement. But I do think that Platinum Angel is the level of card where almost no matter what you're doing, I think you could take it out for Meteor Golem and you'll have been happier to just interact. Uh, you are paying a little bit, of, like Meteor Golem's expensive, but it's just as expensive as Platinum Angel. So let's just make that one-for-one -one swap. And I think I'm just going to be happier to be able to take out the biggest threat on the board versus 
wait around and put a lot of my fate in my opponent's hands, like literally their hands. I'd rather have Meteor Golem a lot of times too, because I've actually made deals with people with Meteor Golem. Some people might have like a flicker spell. There's something that's like really hurting a lot of us. So it's like, okay, flicker my Meteor Golem. I'll get rid of the thing that's hurting us. So if you have like flicker synergies, that can really work. This is colorless, so it can help with removal in any deck that might need help with certain types of removal. And it, even though it doesn't say you can't lose, you know, taking someone like win con out might mean they can't win. Yeah, if you were going to kill me with that Vorinclex or something, if I play Meteor Golem, it says I can't lose to that Vorinclex. We can change around the words a little <laughs> bit. Um, but if you do want that sort of similar effect, there is a card like Platinum Angel that they juiced up to the maximum. This is the Power Crep version, and it's also $4. It's Sarah's Emissary. It is a white card, but Platinum Angel doesn't really have color identity. I think it, generally it's kind of that it leans it leans white a little bit. I think so most angels do. Sarah Emissary says you and creatures you control have protection from the type you name. So what you do is you just name creatures. Now this has multiple immediate effects. It says that your creatures are unblockable. They can't be blocked by creatures and you can't take damage from creatures. Now unlike Platinum Angel, Platinum Angel, if you get attacked for 50, you take 50 and you go to negative 10. With Sarah's Emissary, you get attacked for 50 and you take zero. So the, the Sarah's Emissary always impacts the game. It doesn't just put a wall up. It says you can't take damage from creatures when it's in play. I love this card, honestly, you know. Maybe it's because I'm a Kalia player, but I think this card is super sick. I have named other things other than creatures before, but there has been a board lock where I've had this on the board, someone copied it, and then just we just have to kind of like fight it out with like instants and sorceries because no one else was swinging at us because you can't at that point. Plus, I do like the fact that if you do name creatures and something like Meteor Golem comes down, your creatures will not be able to be affected by it because that's a creature effect. Yeah, this is a card that has that offensive... Uh like knob turned all the way up to it where I can get an immediate impact. I can attack you with all my creatures right away and you can't block. And this thing, sure, it's about as squishy as Platinum Angel, although it can be protected uh, from instant or sorceries if you don't choose creature. But I think the upside of this card is just like, you know, miles and miles higher than, I think so too. than Platinum Angel. And we mentioned the, the offensive uh, side of things. Let's just add like Reaver Titan. It's a $3 vehicle. When it attacks, it deals five to each opponent. And I just have this as a similarly priced both in mana value and dollars way to, instead of being full on defense, let's switch to offense and like let's convert our board state into a win. Instead of waiting around and saying, you can't beat me, how about we just say, I'll beat you? Yeah, I'll beat you first. If it, like We do have a lot of life to play around with, but if you're racing and you want to be the last one standing, you better start chipping away at your opponent's life totals too. So why not just attack with this and chip away at their life totals a little bit faster? Yeah, so next we're going to go to Alloy Mirror. Alloy Mirror is 40 cents. It's a 3 mana 2-2 two -two artifact creature that taps for a mana of any color. There is one big old asterisk that I want to put uh, by this card. It is a mirror, which is relevant for exactly one commander deck. This is the... Uh, Urtet? Urtet. Yeah, I, couldn't, I was never going to think of that name, so thank you. Uh, yeah, Urtet. So I will add, though, only 45% of alloy mirrors are in Urtet decks in the mirror kindred decks. So we're talking about the 55% of alloy mirrors, which I think is about 10,000 of them, that are just kind of in play in, you know, general artifact decks or artifact decks that want creatures. And it's a mana dork, but the... Like, the efficiency of it is very much on the low end. So we, we have some better options and just... We're not going to need to stoop this low for a 3-mana 2-2. Absolutely not. First off is... Ornithopter of Paradise at $1, 0 2 comes down for 2 mana, and it can tap for 1 of any color. I mean, this is just better in general. It comes down earlier, plus it's not like you're really going to be attacking with your ally mirror anyways, so it doesn't matter that uh, Ornithopter of Paradise has 0 attack. It's like maybe you need it as a chump blocker later in the game for a flyer, but early game, it's going to do the same effect for less mana. And even then though, even if we're talking about just chump blocking, I think just having a 0 2 flyer is more useful than having a 2 2 ground creature. It's, it's interesting. I almost look at these creatures like they have no power anyways because they're, you are in, literally incentivized to tap them on your turn. So they're not going to be up for blocking anyway 90% of the time. And you can leave any creature up to jump block if you want um, and just ignore its effect for a turn. So I think Ornithopter kind of blows this out of the water in terms of that. But we do also have a quote-unquote strict upgrade if you're not talking about the mere creature type. But it's Bronze Walrus. 35 cents. It's the same exact card. It's a 2-2 two -two that taps for one of any color. But when it enters the battlefield, you just get to scry too. That's just a little bit of extra value, but it can make a difference in the long run. So It helps fix your draws. It helps set you up. It's not. It's still not what I would call a very efficient card, 
But if you're playing Alamir and you hadn't heard of Bronze Wallers or you're not playing Bronze Wallers, I mean, this is the easiest switch ever, right? Yeah, it's an artifact creature, too. It's the right? same exact, yeah. Everything's the same. It's still got the artifact synergies. You know, if you've got like Dad Bot Urza and you want an affinity for artifacts, it still does all of those same things. Still has two power, still has two toughness. And the thing I really like doing a little bit more than these artifact creatures, because a big problem with them is that you have to wait a whole turn before you can tap them for mana. And we have regular just artifacts to tap for mana. So for three mana, just play Coalition Relic. It's like a dollar. It taps for a mana of any color. If you're not going to attack or block with Alloy Mirror, this is just safer from most board wipes, and it's faster because it works the turn you cast it. But on top of that, you also get to put a charge counter on it, and sometimes it taps for two mana in a turn if you want to take a turn off. I think this card has a lot more usefulness, and it's definitely a lot faster. It can help you double spell. It just does a lot of things that Alloy Mirror can't really do. We're not usually fans of the three mana mana rocks, but if you do need one, you should use one that can tap immediately and has a little bit more potential in the later game. Yeah, and as much as we're not fans of three mana mana rocks, we're like extra not fans of three mana mana rocks that die to creature board wipes and they have to wait a turn to be used. So I think those, even Bronze Walrus and, and, and definitely Alloy Mirror, just a little bit slow. Next is a card that both BZ and I don't like. It's Black Market at $9. It's a five mana enchantment that when it comes down, it does nothing. But every time a creature dies, you can put a charge counter on it. At, and at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you get one black mana for each charge counter on it. So if you go an entire turn and nothing dies, well, you paid five mana for the potential of having black mana, which you don't have if you have no charge counters on it. I think it. the potential of this card is very alluring. And it looks like, well, if I get 10 counters on this, I'm in business. I get to do a lot of things, but I think what people forget a little bit is the upfront cost. Paying five mana, it's a really solid chunk of mana, and it means that even if you play this at five mana and then five creatures die somehow on the next, you know, turn cycle, you untap with this, you make five mana, you're probably feeling like you got a lot out of it, but you're actually just now breaking even on this, and I think even getting to five counters can be tricky sometimes. So we do deck audits, and we've audited at this point hundreds of decks, and we always recommend cutting Black Market. I've never seen the card pop off. I've only ever really seen the slow, you know, uh, boring side of it, and I know that it can have those starts, and it can win you games, but I think those... Per the percentage of time that that is is too small, far too small for, for at least me to want to play this. I think it's a card that's like very hopeful. You're like, yeah, you know, if I have a board wipe or, you know, a bunch of my stuff dies, this is going to be awesome. And it can be very awesome, provided that you get to that pre-combat main phase once it has all these charge counters on it. People are going to remove this if they see it building up. If they don't see it building up, well, you don't have any like kind of like progression with it. Also, I'd like to point out that with that black mana, one, it's only black, all of it, and two, it's only in your first main phase. So you have to play everything there. It doesn't carry over to your combat phase, so no combat tricks. There's no, you know, second main phase stuff. It's only there, so you have to just kind of like put out your entire hand in the main phase one where you actually have that mana. So the things we'd recommend instead, they're all actually way cheaper than Black Market, like Pawn of Ulamog at $4. It says when your creatures die, you get spaghetti monsters that can sack for black or for colorless mana. So every time our stuff dies, we get a creature that represents one colorless mana, but it is immediate, and it is all of our creatures. Um, there's no waiting for it. We get the creature right away, and this is creatures. So if we have Blood Artists or other dice triggers, we get to double up on that. So it says that sacrificing a creature now results in another creature, and we get the mana right away. We do lose the fact that it's black mana. That's a little bit of a downgrade, but we're shaving two mana off, and we're getting the effect whenever we want. I can do I can sack five creatures during your turn to get five Eldrazi spawns, which I can then sack for five mana and play an instant if I want to tap some mana for uh, so for black and then use that. I can cast an instant with it. I really like that potential, having it, holding it up, and then also just, you know, being able to make these buys. So if you need to ch use them even as chump blockers, you can. I think there's a lot more potential with this card. Another great card is Pitiless Plunder at $7. When your stuff dies, you make treasure tokens. This was reprinted recently, and I think it was a great reprint because treasures, there's a lot of synergy with those, and you don't have to just use it in your first main phase like with Black Market, and it's any color. To me, this blows Black Market just out of the water. It is, again, only with your things, but I think Black Market, you kind of also have to assume that you're going to be sacrificing a lot of your own creatures, because that's the easiest way to get charge counters on it. So with Pitiless Plunder, you don't have to spend the mana right away. It's not even in creature form, so it's not susceptible to board wipes. It's colored mana, so it's not even just black. It can be rainbow, whatever you have to do with it. Pitiless Plunder has combos. It's super, super strong. It is a creature, just like Pawn of Ulamog, so I suppose it's more... 
it will die to board wipes and removal a little bit more of the time, but it's less mana and gives you more up front, which I think is a lot. And that's super important in this day of EDH where everything happens right away. It really does. You got to go quick and you got to be able to use that mana whenever you need it because we're, we're usually keeping up a lot of interaction. I mean, interaction is kind of the name of the game nowadays and yeah. you're not just playing things at sorcery speed. I find that whenever I, I, I'm in the position of saying, just you wait until I untap, guys, I never actually get to untap and have that brutal turn, especially if everyone knows it's coming. Priest of the Forgotten Gods is our last one. It's another way to sacrifice creatures to make black mana and it also interacts with the opponent's board states uh, and it even replaces some of the cards you sacrifice. It's $2.50. I think if you're trying to generate mana, this comes down earlier, this works with the Aristocrat decks, it's definitely definitely a better call. Next up, we have a highly played white removal spell. This is Banishing Light at 35 cents. It's two and a white for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, exile a non-land permanent and opponent controls until Banishing Light leaves the battlefield. So there's a couple problems with this, or at least problems in our eyes that lead to us never playing it. It's a three mana sorcery speed effect, but the real problem, the biggest gripe that we have with this is that it's until this leaves. So if somebody finds a removal spell for Vanishing Light or it gets swept up in a late game board wipe or something, the threat that we wanted so badly to remove just actually comes back and now we have to remove it again. When it comes to removal, I want that thing to stay gone, whether it's in graveyard or exile or whatever. I don't want it gone for a little while until you can figure out how to get rid of my thing. Yeah, I don't want my my removal spell to say, you know, opponent can discard a card to, to unremove this <laughs> and re replay their threat. It's just not a place I want to be. Um, I was going to originally put Oblivion Ring on here, but I know the last time we talked about Oblivion Ring, people did bring up that in some decks, we're talking like less than 1%, you can sack Oblivion Ring in response to the trigger to make sure the thing goes away forever. Uh, now, I just want to point out that we don't like playing Vindicate, which is a 3-mana sorcery kill a permanent. I don't think 3-mana sorcery kill a thing is worth the mana, especially when you talk about what you're comparing it to. But at least with Oblivion Ring, you can stack those triggers. Banishing Light is all one trigger, so you actually can't even do that. And to me, that just pushes it so far outside the realm of, I really don't think there's anything to do with this. Even in Enchantress decks, which I guess is what we're going to talk about, there's still some solid replacements, because um, I know you want a lot of enchantments in those decks. But one card to replace this is actually a card we like to play a lot. It's Skyclave Apparition at $2. It comes down for one white white and it says you can exile a, a non-land, non-token permanent that an opponent controls with mana value four or less. And when it leaves the battlefield, they get a spirit that is pl uh, that is XX where X is the mana value of the exiled permanent. Now, I really like this because it is attached to a body and I've seen you recur it from like Carador, sack it, bring it back and play it and get that effect over and over again. The key thing with this, and it has a lot of the same uh, words on it, is that it does exile something and then when it leaves they get something, but they don't get the threat back. They get some vanilla token that isn't going to do anything. Now, uh, Skyclave does have the... I don't know, the restriction, the downside of only hitting things that cost four or less. This is a play to take out people's early developing stages of like mana rocks and enchantments and stuff. But it's also a creature, so you can flicker it, and like Mia said, you can recur it from the graveyard to get more triggers out of it and take out more things. We also have Seal of Cleansing, 35 cent enchantment for one and a white, and you can just sack it to destroy an artifact or enchantment. This is a casting a pretty big net of non-land permanents. We're really just missing creature from that and we can sacrifice it it's still an enchant enchantment so our enchantress stuff if you're playing that kind of deck still draws a card off of it and then you can hold it up and actually use it at instant speed as opposed to the sorcery speed of banishing light i think this is also pretty cool because not only do you get the enchantress triggers it's on the board so it's not like people can really like take see back he's like i didn't see it it's like it was right there the last one is grasp of fate now i want to say that i'm really not a huge fan of this card but if you absolutely need some kind of Oblivion Ring effect for some reason. It's 35 cents to so the same price and it is one white white and you exile a non-land permanent for each opponent until it leaves. So for one extra white mana and the same total mana cost, you just get two more things exiled. So honestly, this to me feels like the hugest of huge upgrades. This is like the absolute daddy of uh, Oblivion Rings, which I still, again, don't like to play, but with Grasp of Fate, it makes the removal aspect of it a little bit more awkward for opponents because if player A kills the Grasp of Fate, sure, they get their threat back, but then player B and C also get their threat back. Now, me personally, I don't want any part of this and I don't want to give anyone their threats back, so I might not play this card, but I do think it is leaps and bounds better than Banishing Light. I mean, we've talked about recently three for one removal, how it's just a lot better value. So if you do have to play these effects, this is a great one.
Moving on to a card that we love to hate because it's bad. It's Secret Rendezvous at Throw 80 shade. cents. This says you and target opponent draw three cards, but what it actually says is that you spend three mana to have an opponent draw three cards for free, and you also happen to get three cards out of it after spending one card. Yeah, this is worded like this This looks fair, and then it's just not fair at all, at least in terms of the deal. To make this fair, you would have to draw four cards, and the opponent would have to draw three because you spent a card. So when you draw three by spending one, you're only up two, but the opponent spent nothing and they're up three. So this already is like, hold on, this doesn't feel fair, but you also have to spend three mana on it. And if we look at some of the white card draw that's been coming out lately, I do not think this is on my radar. I've never felt the need to play this. Maybe in some kind of politics group hug decks. Uh, I don't really count group hug decks because they sort of sometimes have an alternate uh, way to play the game where they're not necessarily trying to win and we are saying that we would cut all these cards uh, all the time if you are trying to win and improve your deck so definitely would get Secret Rendezvous out of there. One card that I think kind of uh, really replaces it is Court of Grace. It makes you the monarch so right away end step you're drawing a card. Next turn end step you draw a card and this is a card that the, the effect of it, the card draw thingy, never goes away, and it can't go away. And also on top of that, you get board presence. You get 1-1 spirits or 4-4 four, four angels if you stay the monarch. I really like the monarch effect too because it gives a little bit more incentive for damage to go around. It makes the games a little bit quicker, and there is the political aspect of it. So it's like, ooh, well, I'll trade you one for one. Busy loves to say that with like Marches and stuff. Monarch that's, for one. That's the other thing is we get to keep our like political back and forth uh, thing going, but I don't have to just like pick somebody and just give them three cards. This is more of like, we can make deals and I can uh, space out the cards and I don't have to give away three at once. I can give away one and then maybe another one and then maybe I'm selfish and I want to keep the card and I want to just block their thing. We also have War Room at $1.80. Quarter Grace was $1.30, by the way. This is a land that can draw you cards based on the colors in your commander's color identity, uh, how much life you have to pay. In white, we're assuming this is mono white. You know, Mono white has historically been having a hard time with card draw. I don't think it's that bad anymore. So we can play things like in our land slot that just help us get cards over the course of the game. It is more pricey for mana, but I am so scared to give my opponents free cards that I've that I'd, I'll just take the cards for me, thanks. I hate giving my opponents cards unless they're getting hurt for it. So this is just giving only me cards. It, I love it in the land slot too because people are usually not going to interact with it. It's hard Because to land destruction isn't really a thing in most casual EDH games. Plus, if you are playing mono white and you put this in, it's really good for your Field of the Dead mana base. Oh, it so is. Yeah, mono white Field of the Dead. It's a thing. Look it up. All right, Mangara the Diplomat is another card at $2.80. This is card draw in white based on what your opponents do. So it has a little bit of that flavor to it, but realistically your opponents are gonna uh, cast two spells semi-regularly. So this is gonna give you maybe one to two cards per turn cycle. It feels pretty good. I like Mangara a lot. It's It's been good for me. It's, a, it's an okay blocker, you know, sure it's got stats. More concerned about consistent card draw that doesn't give my opponents cards. This kind of hides in the back and it's like, well, I'm not doing anything that really hurts and everyone goes, yeah, you know what? That is true. That Mangara guy, he's pretty cool. Next up, it's my boy, Garrick Apex Predator at $7.20. This is a seven mana walker, plus one to destroy a planeswalker, plus one to make a 3-3. Three, three. You can destroy a creature, but really the emblem uh, ultimates, and you get an emblem with, somebody else gets an emblem actually, with whenever a creature attacks you, uh, it gets plus five, plus five, and trample until end of turn. So this is a very, very, very expensive card to come down. The plus one destroy a planeswalker, kind of flavor text, more of a flavorful ability because this version of Garrick is like on a killing spree hunting planeswalkers. That's totally cool to have that. But realistically, the pluses make a 3-3 death touch. That's very, you know, low rate for a seven drop in commander that can be attacked. Planeswalkers generally the weakest card type in commander anyway. So like it's already an uphill battle. So we're the only place I would see this potentially seeing play is in doubling season decks. And that's like, that's it. Um, Outside of doubling decks, doubling season decks, I would say cut this, but we're actually going to also advocate for cutting it even in doubling season decks where you just play doubling season first and then get seven mana and resolve this and then fire it off and get the emblem. I think even in that scenario, you did not get away with murder because you spent 12 mana and you gave one, one person a really hard time, but it's still potentially beatable. God, I don't like this because... We are playing against three other opponents. Having something that just says target opponent, you know, it gets a has a really bad time isn't good because there's go if I were some of the other two opponents, I would say, okay, let's kill the person who put that emblem on him first, and then later we can just go back and attack him because the person with the plus five, plus five and trample, it'll still be there. You also just spent all this mana to heavily invest into one person, and the other two people are completely unaffected. So you're way behind on tempo and mana advantage in regards to those other two players. So we've got things like 
Vivian Reed. Her ultimate gives your creatures plus two, plus two trample, which is, I think is already better than, you know, a one person emblem for plus five. It's, you know, this works for everybody. And they've got a bunch of keywords. It kind of makes your creatures like unstoppable and it's only $2.30. That, I really do like this a lot better because it comes down earlier. It doesn't even have the Golgari restriction. You could play Vivian in a mono green deck. And I think those plus abilities are a little bit better. And it also passes the doubling season test where you can play doubling season and Vivian ultimate right away, keep her around, and then kind of have like a really, really difficult to interact with board state. More so, I think, than with the Garrick emblem. I definitely agree with that. Another one is Kamal, Heart of Croza at $3.50. He gives your stuff plus three, plus three, and trample. He can turn lands into creatures, and he's just a pretty beefy guy. I do like this as a closer a lot better because it's all of your creatures, plus just making creatures out of thin air if you have the mana late in the game. That's a lot better than just giving someone an emblem after getting doubling season out, out after having Garrick resolved. It's just like, a little bit rough. Yeah, if you're looking for expensive finishers that have overrun effects, Kamal is your guy. He can even he can even solo opponents by just saying, "Oh, I got no creatures except Kamal." Pay eight mana, turn four lands into creatures, and then all of a sudden they're attacking for four, eight, twelve, six, sixteen plus Kamal. It could be a really big swing. Uh, next is Garrick, Cursed Huntsman, the other Garrick, uh, green black. Also, this enters with five loyalty and it ultimates at six, and the six ultimate is an emblem that is overrun. It's plus two, plus three trample for all your team. That's really close to the Garrick one, and I'd so much rather have plus three, plus three trample permanently than to one person have plus five, plus five trample when I attack uh, only them. And this is even better in terms of the doubling season test, because you just have to proliferate one time, which does not necessarily require doubling season at all. You can play Garrick, Thirsting Roots, and for seven mana, you get the ultimate and you get the emblem. Or the fact that with Garrick, if it comes down with doubling season, you'll still have him alive later if you want to use his ulti, so you can just build him back up too. I do like having that effect. Maybe you can get his emblem twice. Who knows? I think it's more likely to get his emblem twice than to get the original, the one we're talking Garrick's about. Once. Yeah, Apex once. This is so much mana. I know it's one less for Garrick, but I think that that means a lot, especially when you can curve doubling season on five, you know, in Magical Christmas Land, right? And they don't kill it. Garrick on six. There we go. Now we're talking. All right. Let's get to another one. It's kind of like a pet peeve of mine, just because I don't think it's very impactful. And I, I, I want better from this card. I want better from a Johnny's Pride made at 50 cents. One and a white for a 2-2. Two, two. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. It's got all the, the pieces of a build around. It says, do the thing, and then I will reward you with making your creature bigger. But I just think the reward that we get, even in the best of scenarios where we gain one life 15 times over the course of a long game, we're now left with this vanilla creature that it's not really offering me much. It's very chump blockable and it doesn't kill people. It just kind of says block this. And I don't think that's what these life gain decks are looking for really at all. I'm not afraid of a Johnny's Pride Might at any point. I'll usually have at least a 1-1 one, one around. So even if a Johnny's Pride Might is a 150 attack and 150 toughness, I'll still chump with the 1-1, one, one, and the thing I'll be afraid of most is if I have to remove it with swords or something and you actually gain that life. Right, so not only are we talking about a card that requires a lot of setup. This is not a card you draw on turn seven and are happy about. You've got to play this in the early game. So even if everything goes right for you and you play it early and you get the setup going and you gain all the life and you get it to be huge, what life gain deck is trying to give trample and and like double strike to these creatures? It just feels hard. You know, even Miso's here and he's like, "Are you talking bad about a cat?" And we're like, "Yeah, but it's not you, Miso. It's not you, buddy." It's not you. We love you, but we do love Moxfield.com, the best place online to build your decks. Even Miso loves it. He knew the ad was coming. He knew the ad read was coming, and and you didn't, which is why we bamboozled you. Um, get wrecked, I guess. Moxfield, you can go to find all these cards. You can search these cards. Figure out, oh my god, I have a Johnny's Pride made in my deck. You know, the I can nerds, take it out. Nick Big Nerds recommended cutting it. I can, you know, Alt and two. A very, very simple, like, they have keyboard shortcuts. Alt two will cut a card right out of your deck. Moxfield will never be cut from our souls because we love it. We absolutely love it because you can put Field of the Dead into your decks with it very easily. You can set alternate mana costs. So if you want Force of Will to be counted as a zero mana spell instead of a five mana spell for your curve, you can go do that in Moxfield. We love Moxfield. Go check them out. Go follow us. Yep. Yeah, so we're talking about Johnny's Pride Mate. It's, it's, it's a super high setup. And even if everything goes right and you draw it at the right time and then you trigger it, you still are just stuck with a creature that needs more from you. And that is like, I'm out, right? So I want to play things like Cleric Class, $1.50. It is perfect for life gain because every time you gain life, you gain more life. So it, it works with that. It bolsters your life total. It gets your life up for the cards you need. 
but it's got the other mode of whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. So now we can skip the part where we're stuck with a vanilla creature that we can't use, and we can put it on other creatures that already have flying or lifelink or double strike or whatever, or even just our commander for commander damage, and actually get a lot more done. Plus, there's more, it also reanimates if you just have an, an extra mana to put into it. I really like the classes too, because sometimes we just do have that mana lying around. It's like late in the game, we go, oh, we have a, we have like two, three mana left. Why not just get those effects easily because it just gives you something to do. Yeah, we also have Alenda's Hierophant, brand new card, $2.30 for this one. It's got flying, it's got that life gain counters text, but when it dies, it explodes into a bunch of vampires with lifelink. That's what I'm talking about. Now, if this thing dies to a board wipe or gets spot removed after we do the thing and make it huge, we get a ton of value out of it. I think Alenda is an amazing card, but the biggest thing that was holding it back was the fact that it has an Orzhov identity. But this has the mono white identity. I think this is going to be super cool. And at $2.30, I think that this should be in more decks. Yeah, we're also going to look at Nekthos Paragon, 70 cents. Whenever you gain life, you put X counters on your entire team, uh, but only once per turn. So you want to gain like three life. Then all of a sudden you get a permanent overrun on your whole team. It is not sit around and wait for this thing to grow and then maybe pressure somebody's chump blockers. This is, hey, you're going to die right now because I'm going to attack you for 30 out of nowhere with all my tokens. Maybe that I made from Melinda's Hierophant. I think that this is a lot more impactful. I feel like white likes to go wide. It's not usually like white Voltron. If it's mono white Voltron, it's not going to be a Johnny's Pride mate that's swinging in for the win. So no, That's very true. So you might as well just put on all of your team. Yeah, uh, we also have Voice of the Blessed. I wanted to talk about this one. It's more expensive at 450, but it is the Ajani's Pride Mate of the Power Crept Era. It gets counters and it grows and grows and grows, and then it gains abilities like Flying and Vigilance and Indestructible. If you have to go this route, this is the one to go for. I think Ajani's Pride Mate, it's better just left out of your decks. I really don't think it's going to help you, and pretty much any other life game payoff will do more work for you. The next one is a card that I just don't really see people playing anymore. It's Glorious Anthem at 70 cents. One white white and it says all your creatures get plus one plus one. Does it do anything else? No, it really doesn't. Yeah, it's a tempting line. We want to buff our creatures. We do want effects like this, but I think at three mana um, on an enchantment, the effects like this that don't offer you anything else, these are the ones I've, I've long since cut from all my decks and I really haven't missed them at all. You can get a lot more bells and whistles on your enchantments these days. And I think this might be an accessibility thing, but there's a lot of cheap cards too. You know, you can go on Card Kingdom and order a lot of this stuff for like 50 cents, 35 cents that does similar or better. It just has more more words on it. Like let's go to Paladin class. It's a one mana investment, gives a little bit of disruption uh, during your turn for opponents casting instants. The second mode, now you give plus one plus one to your whole team. You've got that effect, but the last mode just hits like a hammer and you send one creature in and it's huge. It's not hard to get that second mode. You just might wait a little bit longer. This can be an awesome turn one play. Mm -hmm. And then just later you have the third mode. I, I really do like that. Plus I have found that just the little bit of disruption effects do impact the game more than you'd think. Yeah, this gives us two big upgrades on Glorious Anthem for essentially the same baseline thing. Being able to pay four mana in installments with with one being the first installment makes this very, very similar. You could squeeze in it on your curve when you didn't have anything else better to do and then fire it off like a Glorious Anthem at any other point when you would have cast Glorious Anthem. It's just an, it's a really solid card. Not the best card in the world, but still I think a complete upgrade over Glorious Anthem. There's also one I really like. It's Felidar Retreat, 80 cents. And it's an enchantment. Whenever a land enters, you can either make a 2-2 two -two or put a plus one, plus one counter on your entire team and they gain Vigilance. So a bit more upfront, but it can create power out of thin air, which is what Glorious Anthem can't do. And it's part of why I don't like Glorious Anthem, because what if I'm behind? This does absolutely nothing for me. But at least if I'm behind with Felidar Retreat, I can build up a board to then, with the same card, pump and even get through Vigi attacks. I love that because it's only one more mana, but it really helps, especially if you're in those budget like decks, because I know a lot of people are thinking like, oh, if I'm budget, you know, Glorious Anthem is 70 cents, but at 80 cents, you can be playing things like Terramorphic Expanse, and then you could get multiple triggers per turn. I just think that this is really cool and the versatility of it makes it very worthwhile. Yeah, uh, lastly, we have Ultramarine's Honor Guard, 50 cent card. It's a four mana, three, three that pumps your entire team. But also as squad, so as you cast it, you can pay an additional two any number of times, and you get that many extra copies of Ultramarine's Honor Guard. So around the same cost, it is a creature, so it does work with your creature card since you're playing a heavy creature deck, and it pumps your whole team. But if you have six mana, now you get twice the pumps on the rest of your team. And if you pay eight mana, you get three times the pump. We're talking like overrun levels. And of course, past that, you got to nick those out or something. You want to go off, make 75 of them. I don't know. A lot more flexibility in the cost. You know, when you top deck Glorious Anthem on like turn eight, 
This is not a big change to the board state, but when you top deck Ultramarine's Honor Guard, that's a pretty big change. It's one of those cards that slipped under the radar during the 40k era. There were a lot of them that I feel like there are was so much be, to go through. Yeah, be coming up soon. But this one, BZ's played it, and you know, later in the game, it's just like, oh, I guess everything gets plus four, plus four. That hurts. That hurts very badly. Yeah, that really, really hurts. And Ultramarine's Honor Guard is definitely a sick one. Uh, I think. We want to send you to a certain video, and Mia knows what video that is. That is going to be three-for-one removal because we love having value in our removal spells right here.